Welcome to another episode of Reptile Fight Club. I'm your host, Justin Julander, and with me, as mostly, <laughs> or as always, Chuck Poland. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. I'm back. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better, so... Good, yeah, good. We, we, uh, <laughs> finally, pretty much through the inspection, I think we had 18 programs graded uh, today and yesterday, uh, all, all programs on track. We had one needs more attention in, in our aircraft confined space. Um, so that was a huge win. Lots of work went into this. Lots of relieved uh, managers, and uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're finishing up. I think we got um, we got like three more programs to do tomorrow, uh, and then they head out to our test line and do the test line. So um, not quite finished, but um, you know, kind of over the the big hurdle. That's so good. Uh, that. You yeah, survived. it's a huge, huge relief. <laughs> yeah. I made it. I did it. Yeah. yeah. So you still have a job. Um, You're still. Uh, I do. I do. I'm still employed. employed. That's yep. good. That's good. Yep. Well, it is. It, thankfully, it is kind of hard to get rid of us federal workers. Yeah. So you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Just uh, those fun little inspections. Yeah. I, I feel yep. your pain. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, uh, you had time to look at any reptiles or things going well with the collection yeah um yeah everything's going good i had a couple more of those coastals eat i think i have like oh, two that are holding out on me now no, gotta um, love so, the holdouts yeah, yeah i know right like <laughs> yeah. it's just i feel like it's par for par for the course a little bit i uh yeah i don't know what happened i lost my female viper gecko uh oh, the yeah. other day and mm. i i don't know if it was you know, the only thing I can think is, it is you know, I still had the heat and it was pretty hot around here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if it was just too much heat or I, I, I really don't know what happened. So I'm kept pretty bummed about that. Um, you know, I've got I've got some of the offspring that I'm raising and I'm just kind of trying to figure out what I'm going to do now. So, yeah, it was that that sucks. I, you know, that's never fun. Bummer. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then, Got uh let's see, trying to trying to finish that diamond python outdoor uh, enclosure. Oh, yeah. So working on that. I, taking uh, shape, looking good. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I I, nice. um, I I stained it and I shellacked it uh, over the w- last weekend, and <laughs> I've got some shelves that I got to sand and and stain and and shellac. Um, so once once that's a lot of shellacking going on, huh? Oh, definitely a lot of shellacking going on. So once we're all shellacked up, uh, I'll be able to put some animals in there. Uh, that'll be nice. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it's it's pretty hot here right now, so I'm sure the the diamonds are like, yeah, you can wait. You know, yeah. What's they're, your they're plan probably... for that? Like during the heat of the summer, that you're gonna have uh, like some kind of thermally protected yeah, so, spot for them. Yeah. So mm-hmm. the you know it's it's the 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 cage is kind of elevated, and I was thinking about just kind of doing a drop down that's kind of connected to the ground. Um, you know, I it, the the area is on concrete, but if you know, I've just kind of like if you you know in the sun the concrete's kind of warm, but yeah. you know in the in the shade that concrete holds a pretty pretty stable cooler temperature. So mm-hmm. I think I'll just kind of put that 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 lower area in contact with the concrete. That way it's you know, got a big thermal sink to kind of keep them cool and, sure. um, see how that, see how that works. But, uh, yeah. yeah, just trying to, it's pretty big. I mean, it's, it's this, this cage is a lot bigger than the one I have the coastals in. So, cool. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of, they'll have a lot of room to move around. And, you know, I tried to do, I tried to do that whole like, uh, fiberglass, uh, rock uh, yeah. back thing. And man, it's just, I mean, it's not bad. It, it's sure. just like going to take a lot of work, uh, yeah. a lot of, a lot, lot of, of material. Glass yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That can so, be expensive, and, especially. Yeah, and the resin's not days. cheap. And, yeah. the, and the, and the weave uh, isn't cheap. So it's yeah. just like, I was like looking at it like, you know what? This is something <laughs> like, I already have the back done. I've, I've already kind of yeah. shaped it. So I can continue to work on it, yeah. you know, minus the, um, you know, minus everything. And then if I, you know, want to switch it over or whatever, I can do that later. But mm-hmm. I kind of want to get the animals out there and, um, you know, get them going. So I want to yeah. see how they do this year. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, that's what's uh, going on at uh, Casa de Poland. <laughs> nice. But, uh, yeah. How that's about you? Cool. You had a got, reptile uh, show, right? Yeah, yeah. We had the, uh, let's see, the Reptilian Nation uh, show out in Salt Lake this last nice. weekend. So 
that was fun to to catch up it's always good to see the you know the local breeders and stuff that you see year to year and so catching up with those guys you usually see like the same the same folks or folks you know there there's different you know different people that attend the show but you know there's a kind of a core of people who've been around for a while that you know pretty well and you're does joe go to that show yeah yeah joey uh, muggleston's at the show yeah yep um, so yeah, I caught up with him a bit and chatting with him. So that was cool. Um, there were some new, uh, folks at the show that I, you know, hadn't done a Utah show before. So that was kind of cool. Uh, nice. Adeline Robinson, who we had on the podcast, her and her husband were out at the, the show. So, uh, bought Woo-hoo. a, bought one of her prints for the, for the reptile nice. room. Wall, What'd you so get? That'd be cool. Uh, green tree Python. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. I'm sure you've probably nice. seen that one, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And then, uh, um, Let's see. Yeah, David Levinson was there. So yeah, yeah. Cool. He, I was on his podcast a while back uh, when when they were doing that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but and he had the best. Uh, yeah, I, I have such a great. <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> Sorry, had, I had to get my. It's been a while. I got to get my ribbing in on you. Yeah, yeah. He had the best uh, like Photoshop uh, things. So like I, I remember for my episode, he had me coming coming out of a tent in Australia, like in the outback, and like. He was like a kangaroo, or you know, one of the That's the other awesome. co uh, co-hosts was like a bat or something. It was pretty funny. Does he so. do like cartoon drawing or like or, or like? No, it's like just Photoshop. Yeah. Oh, so, got you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I see. But, I see. Uh, I don't know why I'm failing on that name, but yeah. So he's he's definitely creative, but yeah, he'll, he'll he always does these wacky Fourth uh, of July Photoshop thing, or like I guess there are videos with him in it, but like he'll be. Standing there is like his butt hanging out of the, you know, like some draping a flag around him with the, like the an eagle soaring in the background. Or something. it's pretty, he's pretty funny. But yeah, he used to have like a really long, crazy handlebar mustache. Now he has like yeah. a big, giant, bushy beard. But yeah, he walked past me. I'm like, is that David? Like, is he coming to the show? You know, like I, I kind of just looked at him and I thought, you know, if he'd recognize me, I'd like ask him if it's him. But then he kind of looked at me and then kept walking. So I'm like, oh, maybe that's not him. Maybe it's just a guy that looks like him. And then he came over to Adeline's booth and I'm like, oh, that is you, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, I thought that. I thought you looked familiar, but you're more scruffy. I'm like, yeah, I'm more scruffy. <laughs> you got like a full, yeah, you know, wookie on like your face. <laughs> Post COVID strangers passing yeah, in the wind there. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, we, we saw each other when we recorded a podcast three or four yeah. years ago, but that's about it. So, right. Yeah. But it was good to catch up with him, too. Hopefully they're uh, enjoying their time out in Utah. They got a little they, – I think they were headed down south to do a little herping or something. But, yeah. I think I yeah. see not too long ago Adeline posted uh, – yeah, a picture of it looked very Utah-ish. I'm not Utah, sure where she yeah. was, but they yeah. were they were wanting to get out to the salt flats, kind of out west of Salt Lake City, and then they were headed south. I think to see. I I highly recommended that they go check out you know Zion or or yeah. you know Bryce or something like that down south. So hopefully they took that advice. It looks like she's in some Word. you know good good slick rock country, which is yeah where you want to be in Utah. At least that's, that's where correct. I want to be. The mountains That's are correct. cool too. But. That's where I need to be. Yeah, <laughs> man. Maybe we, maybe maybe my vacation coming up. I need to. What are you doing? Are you busy? Um, I mean, I can always make time for Chuck. Maybe so, I can yeah. road trip out to see the doctor. There you go. That'd be cool. Ah. We'll put you up here. I got two uh, two daughters leaving, so we'll get, we'll have a couple uh, guest rooms free up. So <laughs> I'll bring the dogs. Yeah. Yeah, well, you can leave them all. You're like, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. we've got enough dogs you around here. Cr- you keep your crazy crackhead dogs at home. <laughs> no, uh, your dogs are right. welcome. They'd have fun nah, with our dogs, they'd... I'm sure. Oh, I'm sh- dude. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you know, fight with them, whatever. <laughs> yeah. We have a little dog run out the side of the house, so it's a lot of space. And you know, uh, I mean, yeah. That, that you know, my dogs yeah. are California dogs. The cattle, California cattle dogs that have not seen the open range <laughs> yeah. quite like quite like your dogs probably uh, have so they're go. like whoa this is a big dog park you know <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 that'd be great to have yeah that'd be a lot of fun cool yeah man. you've yeah, put I, me I, up a, a couple times so i owe you for sure nah, yeah, no worries yeah out. well I, I you know trying to yeah. still trying to figure out we got i gotta get my buddy tommy through uh test line mm-hmm. uh once that's done then then uh, i'll start thinking about vacation but there you go. i can't can't leave my wingman <laughs> hanging yeah 
Well, so the, the you know the show went well. We we moved a few animals, so that's good. Made some room, so just in time, the uh, brettles are pipping today. So nice. <laughs> yeah, I came home from work, nice. went down, they're sticking their heads out. So hypo to hypo brettles. So How hopefully big a we should have some that? nice ones. It's like twenty. 15? Yeah, twenty. <laughs> yeah, first time breeder. All the eggs are perfect. They're all looking good. I open them up. They're some some good looking stuff in there. So I'm you yeah, and I'm your big you, you and your big. Clutch I know. Problems. I don't know what I'm going to do with twenty uh, brittles, yeah. but yeah, they'll uh, they're they're usually pretty straightforward. So I'm not yeah. too worried about it. But yeah, I got about half the inlands eating, so that's good. They're moving in the right direction. Now Saturdays are the days that I clean the rodents and feed the babies. So I mm-hmm. missed uh, my Saturday with with the show. So I I got to play a little catch up and hopefully yeah. you know they're nice and hungry for this next uh, try and we'll get all of them <laughs> going. But a few of them have shed, so that's good. They're second shed, so um yeah blackheads still don't want to take on their own so i did an assist feed there with uh, some baby food so we'll see see how they do pick up but i got some great graded uh sorry great advice from uh one of my australian buddies um and uh so hopefully i can improve things a little bit but yeah steve crawford um he does the aussie wildlife show Mm -hmm. um he's the man like he's 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 British, but he lives in Australia, and he's like bred just about everything. So yeah, so he's uh, putting his uh, Owen Pelly pythons together to, to nice. This year. Yeah, but yeah, he nice. sent me a video. He's making this huge like outdoor shingleback uh, skink enclosure. Looks pretty sweet. So very cool. Yeah, I'm jealous that they. But he put you know, so he puts you up on a little blackhead python game, right? Yeah, yeah. He's he's giving me some tips to help try to improve my incubation success. Right. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I, I'd like to get better, than, you know, twenty percent uh, success rate or whatever yeah. I got. So yeah, but yeah, it's nice to have uh, people who know what they're doing uh, give you advice. Always, so, always yeah, good times. But rarely do we ever get there alone. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, Brettles, Pippin. I think that's that's my last snake clutch. I've still got a few uh, gecko eggs that are incubating some uh, nefarious wheeler eye. So yeah, I was gonna say how that awesome. how's that wheeler eye doing? Yeah, doing great. Yeah, I just fed cool. them this afternoon. They're chasing around bugs, so yeah, they're doing nice. great. Nice. Um, yeah, can't complain. Everybody seems to be happy and doing well. So cool. Yeah, one of those cool. times. Well. Let's get on with the show. Yeah, enough say? about us. Nobody no, cares. Us. Nobody show. cares. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares. All right. Now, uh, we've got with us a guest today, uh, as you've probably seen from the uh, description of the episode, if you're <laughs> listening. Uh, but Dominic uh, Carboneau, is, am I pronouncing that correctly? You're pretty damn close. Okay. <laughs> cool. Cool. Which cool. is good for Justin. Yeah. <laughs> Normally he's like the name, the name, don't yeah. remember the name. So Yeah. Yeah, you're you're doing well if I can remember a name at all, but I'm I'm surprised I remember Chuck's name half the time. But Whoa. Yeah. Welcome to the Reptile Fight Club. Uh oh, yeah, thank why don't you. you tell us a little bit about yourself. Where uh, you first, fit in, in the hobby. Uh I've been doing reptiles for, geez, I don't know, since the 90s, too. I'm probably okay. close enough to your age. Um, mm-hmm. I've been breeding for a very long time, and I think this is a big part of this episode. Yeah. Um, I figured we should chat about it. Uh, so where right. do I fit in? Um, I've been keeping for, I don't know, I guess I'm about 25, maybe possibly up to 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, worked in a zoo for about 10 to 12 years a long oh, cool. time ago from like when i was 16 to maybe 25 uh okay. then i which, became which uh little rains reptile zoo which is a little zoo in canada it's now the biggest rescue uh-huh. organization in canada and they've actually have a couple of places in uh united states now they do a lot of uh oh, like cool. museum tours for like three four months and move on from one place to another great little place uh mm-hmm. did that for about 10 years but uh needed a real income and uh became yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I needed a job that pays. I became an advanced care paramedic, and, yeah. Yeah. and the, now I'm doing uh, oh, real cool. estate and uh, paramedic. So, um, yeah. Okay, nice. Um, I've been keeping mainly Morelia my whole life, um, and I've kind Good of man. Good man. diverged a little bit everywhere since then. And uh, yeah. 
it's funny, like never bred before and then started much more later in life. And uh, last couple of years have been really, really good. Uh, full racks of babies, yeah. uh, almost too many. Um, I think last year I produced yeah, yeah. 112 baby Morelia. This year I oh, wow. didn't do as well. Yeah. I did more clutches, but less babies. Uh -huh. I think I did just under 196. Uh -huh. I got seven clutches. <laughs> and I think I reached out to you because I bred two new uh -huh. things this year. I uh, bred uh, Antaresia, the pygmy pythons, for the first time ever. Uh, uh, dang oh. it, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I was I pretty happy with this. <laughs> Uh, oh wait, oh. pygmy python. I'm thinking pygmy, pygmy python. bandits. Yeah. No, no, gotcha. no, no. Pygmy. Yeah, pygmy That's pythons. why I reached it. Prothensis. Uh, Those I have. Yeah, Prothensis yeah. I have. <laughs> yeah. uh, they're they're I've got horrible. Pygmy bandits on the mind too. But yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, trust me, cool. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the most cool snakes ever, but man, yeah. they're horrible to get going. Yeah, I didn't I, get any this year, so I'm like, eh, maybe that's not a bad thing. But yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm doing I'm doing horrible with the babies. I got six babies, and I oh, shoot. Uh, three of them I shipped to my friends. He's still trying to get them feeding. Mm -hmm. he, um, the three on my end, I'll be honest, they they all three of them died. Uh, none, I I, yeah, I kept assess yeah. feeding them, and then after about a month and a half, all three of them perished, which is really rough. So I don't know what I'm doing uh, wrong, but yeah, and it's yeah. so um, I bred Angolan pythons for the first time this year. I was pretty happy. Those are oh, cool. Congrats. Those yeah, were, that's cool. Thanks. They honestly, I bred them exactly like a carpet python. It was, I did nothing yeah. different and it went really well. And uh, I got six clutches yeah. of different carpets uh, IJs, coastals, uh, did Darwin's and did some weird crosses. Um, I'm trying to go mm -hmm. for the, 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 the big. Uh, what's, what's it to say? Like the, the big morph game there. I'd love to have a, a white snake. So, I bred a super yeah. caramel exanthic pure coastal to an albino to produce the triple head, okay. or I should say the caramel double head to try to eventually go for that morph combo, which is like the 10 year plan. But I'm, you know, no, overall yeah. it's been really good. So i um, been breeding for cool. quite a while. So I figured uh, we can try to hit on that subject and uh, see if I can debate one of you two guys. Although I don't think I can compete, but I'll try. <laughs> Oh, I, oh, I'm nonsense. sure you'll compete just fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, now Dominic had a, a, a suggestion for an earlier show that we did. So and then he he gave us some really good suggestions, made a couple more. So I'm like, you got to come on the show and and, and yep. debate these in person. So we're glad to have you on. Thanks for coming. And uh, thanks. I'll do I'm my sure best. It'll be a fun discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So today we're talking about breeding. You know, if uh, you know if we if we need to breed our snakes to everything with a cloaca as as chuck loves to say and and here you know that's his say. favorite <laughs> his favorite uh, statement there but um or you know if we if if you even need to breed your stuff or you know if you could kind of slow it down or kind of fill it out so um yeah we'll we'll go for that so let's uh chuck uh give us a call on the first coin toss to see who heads gets to the venue. It's heads, of course. You're, <laughs> you're the winner. So, <laughs> all right, man. Well, I'll give you a break. I'll debate this one. Okay, I'm I'm sure right. everybody's sick of hearing from me anyway, so they want to hear the the chuck. They love they you. Come for they the love chuck. the doctor. <laughs> no, nope. they, they they stay for the chuck. They come for the Justin. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. So give it a go, and and then uh, Dominic, if you want to call, and then we can uh, you know, see who gets what side. Let's go for What's heads. That? Heads. Heads. It's, it's actually tails. So Chuck's a, Chuck's a double winner today. So what wow. side do you want to take, Chuck? Uh, what, 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 okay, so what? Uh, should you breed so, your snakes? So should you breed you know, everything? Yeah. Just breed everything you, yeah, indiscriminately? Or should you, you, or should you, oh gosh, I'm going to say that you should be a, a very discriminate breeder. So don't breed your snakes to everything. Okay. Or or at all, so that's kind of on. That or side. at all, yeah, 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 yeah. So don't breed or breed, you know, <laughs> modestly. Okay, all right. Does that sound good? That's you sounds, ready for this? <laughs> sounds like you took the easier side to to debate. Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Without yes, I did. shame. Without shame. <laughs> yep. Yep. 
Right. I've been I've been I've been Julendered enough times that uh, <laughs> oh boy, well and, I, and I'm sure I I'm sure Dominique's coming prepared, so <laughs> it shouldn't yeah. be a shouldn't yeah. be a bad bad uh, discussion either way. So, all right, well since you're the double winner today, Chuck, do you want to go first or do you want to? I will go first. Steam guest. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll go first. Okay, go I for it, man. <laughs> so you know, I mean, I think. You know, it, it can be well. Well, it can be super exciting to produce tons of stuff, and and uh, you know, you can get caught up in the madness of of, of breeding and and the excitement of it. Um, you know, on the other end of it, uh, you know, most people don't have unlimited space. They don't have an unlimited food supply or pocketbook to be feeding things. And you know, you know, the other part, the biggest part to that is most people don't. Um, you know, uh, have the the time someone like Nick Mutton does to, to to call people and sell animals. So you know, a lot of times you you it's easy to produce, but sometimes they're hard to move, and so you can get quickly get overwhelmed with lots and lots of animals, lots and lots of work, uh, and and you know, I think um, it, the the problem with overproducing is is you got to find a home for those things if you produce them whereas you know if you breed modestly or or don't breed at all you know you can get to kind of take the easy road with the animals and and all you're all you're really worrying about is the uh i guess the adults or the animals that you have not necessarily the offspring that they produce so kind of kind of maximize your enjoyment uh, 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 of the reptiles that you have because to be quite honest you know breeding is amazing but it's a lot of work uh, and anybody uh, who who is you know hatched uh, you know uh, 10 clutches uh, in a year will tell you yeah it's it's an insane amount of work and um, so you know I think that's probably how I would lead is is just the the amount of work and the amount of time and and energy that that breeding um can can take up in your life uh you might be best served by just sitting back and enjoying uh what you have and not having to breed it wait wait so clarify this you're saying you should be you should be ready for babies like to house them and stuff when they hatch you you should you yeah. should, you and Owen should. Yeah. Congratulations uh, he, to the Mac and Wookie, by the way. I oh saw yeah, his, uh, yeah. We forgot got the, to got the white the pythons. I, I, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's pretty. Awesome. That's pretty awesome. I know. Owen I told him it was macintastic that he did it. It was <laughs> good, man. It was good. <laughs> yeah, way to go, Owen. That's awesome. Yep. If you're if you're listening, always sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All Good right. Job. Go ahead. No, yeah. no. So yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, obviously, you you want to be ready for the offspring, but a lot of times you hear that people are like, "Oh crap, I have more eggs than, than space." You know, I've got. I don't have enough room. Well, and it's for all easy these, to. Have, you know, offspring. I mean. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You just don't always know what you're going to get, right? Okay. Yeah. So when it all goes. Ugh. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> sorry go ahead. Quiet. That's okay. Yeah. So yeah. true. And it's going to be harder for me to debate because I think I'm much more on your side, but I'll play the devil's advocate and go for the other side. Sure. So to me, you're missing out. You plainly, simply said, if you look at all the enjoyments and how much you learn and how much you can truly get from breeding, you tell me you don't want to work, you don't want to put time into it, you want to just enjoy just your animal, but you're missing the entire other aspect of owning animals. I mean, think about it. When you're breeding... What are you looking at? You're looking at their cues. You're looking at when they're going to be producing follicles, when they're going to ovulate. You're second guessing yourself. You're doing all these things. Then finally you get eggs. The next year it's even easier because you're like, I know this girl does it. I know this girl does that. You, you learn and you learn and breeding truly makes you a better keeper. And every single time you breed, you get better and better. You learn more about your animals. You learn more about how each animal is different. Should you breed everything? That's debatable, but you should definitely breed. Because I think that you can definitely learn mm. a lot from every single animal. And as a keeper, you'll improve. And it'll also probably lead you to become maybe even a keeper that will even, I don't know, attack harder to breed species. Go for those species that other people are having troubles. Like this year, I went for the pygmy pythons. Do I regret it? Maybe. But I did it, and I never thought I would do it before, and I'm pretty happy I did it. I learned a lot about it. 
I mean, I bred a species that for the first time, I never even saw them lock up. I never saw them cuddling, anything like that, but somehow it happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I screwed up with the babies. The babies aren't doing or thriving like I'm doing, but I'm learning from it and I'm progressing as a keeper because of it. So I think that everybody should strive towards being able at some point in their time of keeping to breed and improve improve their, their knowledge, improve their, their keeping, improve, I don't know, everything about the animals in that sense, if that makes yeah, any sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I like that point that too. I, you know, I just, I, I really like that point that you pay more attention to your, you know, your animals if you're trying to breed them, I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, yeah. so otherwise you might get, you know, okay, I've had this animal for 10 years and you know, what, what else? But so, yeah, I think that kind of keeps the excitement. You're, you're always keeping your females and you know, males in peak condition. So yeah, to support that. I like that yeah. statement. Yeah. And, and I mean, to be honest, I, 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 you know, I, it's hard for me to argue something like that. I, I, I fully agree with that as somebody who has, uh, you know, bred and, and, and done that and moved on to harder species. Like I'm, I'm fully on board with exactly what you're saying. I, I think, I think the big issue probably comes when you, when you say, well, I'm going to breed everything I have as much as I can. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think there's, there's kind of an issue in the hobby where if everybody did that, where do those animals go? What, what happens to those animals? And, um, you know, I fully agree with you. If you don't breed those animals, it's, 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 it's the sticky wicket, right? If you don't breed those animals, you don't produce these fabulous offspring uh, that move forward, selectively bred genetic projects uh, and, and push into new boundaries and create new bloodlines and do all these things that, that we absolutely have to continue to do. But at the same time, if you, if you, if, 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 if the push is always to the max uh, and, and everybody looks at it like I have to breed, then you end up with a problem of more, you know, more animals than there are people um, to, to, to take care of them. And, and then what happens to those animals? And, and then it becomes like, is this, an, is this an ethical concern? Are we being, you know, ethically sound with, with what we're doing? And I think that's, that's probably where, and you know, where's that line? What, 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 um, because, you know, I, I don't think that line is the same for carpets as it is for retics, as it is for ball pythons and where where the homeostasis in the market is for for different species. And, and you know, it, 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 we're such a niche. I'm sorry, nipper community. And, and, you know, it's, but, but, but carpets are gaining, you know, they're gaining uh, strength and, you know, new morph combinations are interesting people. So the, there's a lot of fluid dynamics going on there, but I think o overarchingly my, my concern would be one of ethics in overproduction. Okay. So could we consider if we overproduce, could we consider alternative things for snakes? So one of the, the things you could say is that, Let's go with ball pythons. What do you do when you have too many ball pythons? What do you do when you have too many normals or unlucky, I don't know, not hitting the odds on your, your morph? Could we ethically consider using snakes as feeders? Could we consider alternatives to overproducing if it does happen, which would technically not be a bad thing. A lot of animals eat snakes. A lot of snakes eat snakes. Now, can you overproduce if you can use them as a feeder? Because right now I can tell you a lot of people would love to have feeder snakes for their other animals. I can tell you my Womas, every single baby that don't make it, it's always Woma food. And I've always trained them like that. Now, is that a bad thing? If one comes out with a kink, I, 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 I personally don't want to reproduce that. I don't want to give it to a friend. I don't want to. I think, I, I, I think it's food. So one could argue that if you produce everything and you have too many, maybe one of the arguments could be that why not use it as an alternative food source? And, and that's a fair, valid, and good argument. I, I agree with you, and I think that there's no reason not to. Um, you know, I, I think the issue that comes into when you go down that road is there that a lot of a lot of breeders. Uh, 
do it for the they, they love the animal they love you know they love what they're breeding and their heartstrings get attached to those animals and they they have a hard time breeding and then and, and then sending that 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 stream into a food source prey which is weird yeah. because we have no problem breeding rodents to do that and it's a it's a it's a way we look at it and i'm not saying that everybody is that way i'm just saying that i i think that's a complication to the argument that you're making but but nonetheless i i d- definitely agree with you i'm sure justin assist feeding his blackheads uh is probably on your side with this one um <laughs> You know. I, that's always a tricky one for me because I, you know, I, I got in this because I like snakes and it's hard to. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. obviously, if it's stillborn or it's kinked, I'll throw it into the blue tongue cage or something. They'll they'll eat it pretty quick. But um, you know, if I had a healthy offspring, I'd have a really hard time um, feeding it off to you know something. But that's just personal preference. What about if you yeah. overproduce or if you have too many? Yeah. Well, I th- I I would maybe consider like a wholesaler yeah. or something before I would but you know I guess I mean ethics there are, there are some ethical considerations because um, you know a lot of times I feel bad selling an animal thinking you know is this animal going to be neglected or you know those kind of things that, sure. and and obviously a, a rapid you know either euthanasia or or feeding to a you know a king co- a cobra or, or a black-headed python might be more humane in the long run than, than you know, selling it to somebody who who loses interest in a month or two, and, you know that. Kind and of thing. again, and again, like you know, it's it's kind of a nipper thing. Like in carpets, you know, crosses are 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 so like a oh, worthless snake. It's a crap. It you know, um, mm-hmm. get that thing out of here. Who cares? And you know, I mean, my. I, you know, I, I'm I'm sure everybody's heard my get down is I think I think crosses are awesome. There's you know you 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 put stuff that doesn't normally breed together and you get cool shit out of it. So mm-hmm. you know w- whether you're you're hung up with the name or the the taxonomic conundrum that you put yourself in, who cares to me? Like you know what I mean? They're all they're all snakes in boxes. They're not in the wild breeding. We're not trying to repatriate. Um, you know we're not trying to repatriate australia for for the aussies they don't need our help so <laughs> you know who cares like um i feel like you're but, arguing but, but, my you know, I mean, well <laughs> p- perhaps perhaps but you know i mean i i but but i think the problem the problem is that when you when you do go and cloaca it out <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you potentially can produce a ton of byproducts, which, you know, are, are crosses or stuff that you're using to make specific morphs. And you make what is, quote unquote, the undesirables uh, of carpet pythons. And, and those go to wholesalers or they, they get sold for cheap and, but, and, and regarded it for cheap. But does it matter? Um, a lot of times. Does it matter? Well, I think it, I think it matters for the long term. When for for the sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, keep in mind, it's a snake in a box, right? We're not putting these in nature. We're not shipping them back to Australia. We're not affecting any wild population. So why does it matter? Why does it matter if that snake's going to be sold well, for twenty dollars instead of two thousand? If it's not the right more for the weird cross? Because. Because I think because I think people treat animals. Unfortunately, people treat those animals accordingly to what they uh, what they associate a value to it. So if you pay uh, ten thousand dollars for a bull and eye, you associate that as a ten thousand dollar animal, and you protect your investment accordingly. But if you only paid Sixty bucks for a, a cross carpet, and something happened. You know, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't look out for that animal, right? No, the way it is, yes. It's it's. I to me, it's just kind of a human thing, and 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 the issue is how we talk about uh, uh, crosses or hybrids or whatever within the carpet community. It's how we it's how we label them and name them, and and I you know I've tried to say like. Some of the most awesome snakes I've seen were were crosses, and people are like, "Who cares? You know, get it out of here, whatever. You know, feed it, feed it to a cobra." Which, fine, if you can. I'm just saying, 
I don't disagree with with all of that 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 line. I'm just saying that th- that there's some complications around when you go down that road. A lot of keepers don't want to. A lot of keepers don't have cobras to feed them to. But you know, a lot of people um, have issues feeding to varanids or you know snake eating yeah. snakes. So going back on a few things you said. First of all, um, when you say do you know how many people have ten thousand dollar snakes they keep in a ten dollar tub or they you know what it blows my mind like it's it's not like other hobbies people have will have the most expensive animals and have the cheapest tub set up for it with and not even have a thermostat or just have a heat pad plugged directly and why is that i don't know why the hobby is like that but i think your your argument falls short on that one because whether you produce a ten dollar snake or a ten thousand dollar snake, not always, but many people will keep them the same way, and will keep them in the smallest setup, or will keep them in the tubs where the ten thousand dollar snake, the same way as the fifteen dollar snake, will be kept very similar. Okay, not everyone, but many. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I think I think I think your point is nuanced because as somebody who keeps Tracy A. Um, you know, I would keep my Tracier in a in a a small tub, not because uh, I don't care about the animal, but because the animal because the security f- for the animal is vital. So n- sometimes it's not necessarily about the cost of what you're keeping it in, but the appropriateness for the animal. Um, now, if you're keeping a, you know, if you're keeping a, a ten thousand dollar bull and I in a, a two dollar tub, uh, and you know that that is just absolutely not uh, in the best interest of that animal or whatever, yeah, clearly that's a, that's a situation where. You know the the rack mafia mentality is prevailing over um, the animal's best interest, and and I would say that's the rare in- instance where you would see somebody uh, allowing you know their their incredibly uh, costly investment to override their common sense. Um, I you know I think a lot of the people who are trying to do bull and I well. Uh, are spending qu- quite a bit of coin to to try to do that, and and bull and I is tough because you know outside of 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 w- one guy uh, who seems to be on it to it this year, uh, he who shall not be named, but is uh, fingers crossed for um, you know it's been one of those things where it's kind of anyone's guess. We kind of know how Python reproduction works. Uh, we, we kind of have some good ideas based on some previous experiences, but Bull and I just don't seem to be reliable. Like a lot of scrubs don't seem to be reliable. So it's, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and, and your point is well taken. I just think that there's some nuance there where you don't necessarily have to spend, you know, ten thousand dollars on a ten thousand dollar snake to house it uh, if you meet its requirements. I, I don't think that a snake looks at an enclosure and says, you know, this is not the Ritz Carlton. Uh, I I need an, uh, a more expensive enclosure to be happy. I think as long as you're meeting its needs, it's not really concerned about how expensive its its uh, enclosure is you know what i mean yep i, I i'm kind of hoping that we're we're coming out of that as you know i think a lot of us especially our age we're kind of raised in the you know shadow of people like brian barcheck who had row upon row of tubs you know and so yeah. we all looked at that and went oh i want to do that someday you know i want to be a big breeder a professional breeder and have a, a row of tubs you know but i think there's a little bit of paradigm shift and I'm hoping that's taking hold and that pretty soon more people will be keeping in cages or larger enclosures. And, and look, but, I mean, man, not that a tub can't serve a purpose. I mean, yeah. m- most breeders need to keep their babies in tubs, but Ooh. you know, I'm hoping we're, we're, we're moving kind of beyond that mindset, I guess, as a whole. Yeah. The, well, there's the whole, there's the whole animal behavior portion of that and the whole animal husbandry portion of that. And you shouldn't conflate those two things. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the bull and so going back to breeding now, can you imagine if I told you I know 20 people, we all have bull but we only keep one each. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
your argument, you're supposed to be arguing the fact that we shouldn't be breeding everything, right? So why don't we just spread the Bolins around or spread any other Bismarck pythons, any other ones that are slightly more rare in the hobby, and we just keep them, right? Let's just keep, let's just enjoy them. Let's not breed them. That's how it was done so, back in you no, know, but the, the should 80s should we and, yeah, should we do like that? that? Or should we argue that, you know what, we should breed all these snakes. We should put them together. We should pair them. Well, I mean, I think, I think, yes, I mean, I, you know, I have, I have, I have th three Tracy A that I bred um, together. Um, now, that's one, you know, that's, call that one pair of snakes, right? Um, it, you know, should I breed that? Of course I should breed that. Now, if I had, you know... 50 Tracy A and I had the formula for breeding Tracy A. Is that reasonable? Should I breed that? Yes. Because the question becomes how many Tracy A <laughs> keepers are there out there? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, uh, when I bred mine for the first time, it was really like, oh, that's been done? Okay, well, that's old news then. And people moved on. So once you, once you breed something like that or once, you know, the, the mystique of being the one who did that wears off, all of a sudden then you figure out people maybe care less about some of this stuff and, and then you get the real climate of where that market is. And I'm not saying that, that I couldn't sell 50 clutches of Tracier. I'm just saying that, you know, sometimes people go into it thinking one way and, and and once the wash works out and and you've got all these animals then then it's like oh the demand wasn't as high as i thought now you have all these animals that are potentially rare highly valuable but they're all on the market at the same time and they're rare as, as crap and they all need to have good outcomes for the future of that captive species to, 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 to move on. So breeding it all at one time may not be the solution. And I, I guess it's unfair because I think I picked either not breeding them or rarely breeding them. And, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm winning on both counts here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide over to my rarely breed them and say, you know, you, you, you have to be able to – it's not reasonable for, for breeders, um, especially rare – guys who do rarer stuff to never breed their animals. That makes no – that doesn't so make any sense. So if the one guy finds the perfect recipe and can breed – I'm going to go back to Bull and I uh, – can breed them and can produce 50 clutch. That one guy can do it, but no one else, or what is it, one or two people successfully do it every now and then? Okay, but if that one guy, you're telling me he shouldn't do it. Well, I'm not saying well, he should. I just don't think he should breed all 50 Well, why them. not? If I he think can, he should. he should. Well, because... Because because he can share what he knows and other people can breed theirs and, and you shore up your genetic diversity that way. Now, if I were to just have the recipe and I breed 50 clutches and I am the king of the jungle, I don't share my secret with anybody and I make a lopsided, um, uh, you know, a, a very lopsided um, uh, genetic diversity because, you know, all of the animals were highly related – or, or or all come from the same it, it's it's not as robust you're and, just making it look and, bad now it doesn't mean they're all related they could all be <laughs> separately they well, could be genetically all diverse you're just i'm just saying that if somebody could do it why wouldn't they would it crash the market possibly but wouldn't you be happy to buy a, a freaking bolins for a thousand bucks instead of 10k i'd be happy i i might sure. actually own them i don't but, see where it would be a bad thing if somebody is able to breathe in vast numbers, and if you can't move them, you adapt. I, I, at first, when I was first breeding, I only had one or two clutch, and I didn't know how to sell them. It would take me the entire year to sell them. And then the next year would come, I still had leftover babies. Now what do I do? I hate selling. I hate dealing with people. I, I well, wholesale okay. them, and I, I move them out. So, so let's not talk about a species that's hard to breed and, and isn't produced in any real Can numbers. We? Let's talk about a species that's easier to breed and produced in much greater numbers. Because I think that's where, that's where the argument gets. It's easy to make that argument with a rare, hard well, to breed I have species. To use it, my <laughs> but is it easy to make that argument with a common? No, no, no. I understand what you're saying. I got you. I got you. I'm with you. You're right. No, you're right. You're not wrong. You're right. But – 
you know, where, 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 where I think, where I think, you know, the community suffers the most is probably in the, in the, the less difficult stuff, the, the more widely kept and, and widely bred stuff. Um, that's, that's where we see kind of the, the ills of and produ- not, not, overproduction. Not, not to gang up on Dominique or anything, but I, you know, I, I, I think even, even if there were, you know, 500 bull and I that all of a sudden appeared captive bred and, and hit the scene and they were a thousand dollars each. I, I still would question, you know, if, if a lot of people could do them justice because they're a very specialized python. That's why they're rare. That's why nobody's mm-hmm. breeding them is because they're very specialized, hard to keep properly. They die fairly easily if you're not, you know, if you're missing something. So, you know, maybe that's even captive bred or or, or uh, young animals taken from the wild um, don't fare well a lot in captivity. So, you know, there could be that kind of ethical concern with and, producing and to, them and, and putting them and in the wrong hands. And to his point, though, I mean, yeah. if somebody could produce fifty of them, mm-hmm. or or you know, oh, definitely fifty clutches the of them. Yeah. Sure, that's. I sure. mean, that's good. But I just, I mean. <laughs> That's probably not going to happen anytime soon. I guess soon. I'm seeing a lot of those probably suffering and, and, yeah. and meeting yeah. an so untimely end, whereas... If yeah. we <laughs> shift to something more common, whether it be carpet python or even yeah. the more common one like ball pythons, which this is going to irk me to say, but there's a reason there's <laughs> tons of ball pythons created everywhere, right? There's ball pythons galore. People breed them like crazy. They're everywhere. You go to a show, yay, 90% of all the tables is ball python, right? Okay. I, it, it drives me completely insane. That being said, for wh- why is it 90% ball python? Because 90% of all the keepers like ball pythons. They all keep ball pythons. They all do it. So is it bad to breed that much in those ridiculous numbers? Maybe not. Because you know what? If we couldn't sustain a show with 90% ball pythons, or if we couldn't sustain all these people breeding all those ball pythons, people would stop breeding them. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah, but I mean, w- yeah. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I feel like we 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 <laughs> condemn the whole rack thing. Where do you think the rack thing came from? Because everybody's <laughs> got to shove hundreds of ball pythons into somewhere, and and you know, it, all these people who are sitting on their ball pythons is because the market's full of tons of of ball pythons. And you know, if everybody at the end of the year was moving their ball pythons, I think. And yeah, do I think that people get into it and get weeded out because they think they're gonna make money breeding ball pythons, and then they find out that you gotta breed snakes for the love of the game, not for the love of the money yeah uh, absolutely that's a thing but at the same time there's still tons of people who have the love for the game who have tons of racks full of ball pythons because we overproduce ball pythons and we do it because why we're trying to make this combination that combination oh i didn't hit this i gotta hit this combo Uh, you know the odds on this are long and i got this but i had to do you know i had to to make four or five clutches of it before I hit it. And it's like, you're chasing, you're chasing, you're producing, you're producing. And, you know, to your point, if we had these other, you know, I don't want to say waste streams, that's not the right word, but, but, uh, feet, you know, feeder streams or something where these animals could be used. That's just not where they're, they're going. I, I, I think they're kind of, you know, meeting, meeting probably a short life and, and not, not the best life. Um, so, so I, I just think when, when you talk about animals that are produced in mass, um, like ball pythons, th- this is where the issue, like you see, you know, you can kind of see the issues that come out of it. And, and yeah. I, I see, I, I, I well, definitely to, see the ethical reason, like the ethical issue with having too many snakes and having too many snakes in, in tubs and continuous, um, but this isn't a debate about the rack system or whether or how we're keeping them. No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to debate cages over racks. <laughs> well, I mean, well, to, I, to Dominic's point, like I, I thought that, uh, you know, how, how many people got into ball pythons for kind of the money or, or the, the fact that there's a million different morphs. I thought one of these days, this, this, 
you know market or whatever. <laughs> this house of cards yeah, this is house coming of down. Cards will fall. Yeah, but it hasn't. I mean, it no. continues on, and it almost gets stronger in some ways, and it's it's really impressive. But I, you know, I look at uh, you know other other things, and you know, even though there's morphs and there's excitement to some extent, it just doesn't have the staying power that the ball pythons have. So you know, I sure. I don't know why that is, but. You know, and I don't want to have a giant collection of ball pythons. I'd much rather work with Morelia. Yeah. You know, they're much sure. more well, along. But, I, but but to the you know to the ball pythons credit, it's 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 had a lot of staying power, and and it can survive all the animals that have been produced and keep going. Think, you know, it's pretty yeah, impressive. And, and I mean, go I'm ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, think of all the friends or people that asked you. Like, I can name you this many times. Like two years ago, they're like. So I want to get into ball pythons. I want to get into the breeding game. I want to do, I don't know how many times I told them, I'm like, honestly, you're too late. Like everybody else is doing it. There's like, you'll never keep up with all these other people. And yet, just like you're saying, it's it's not dying off. It's not going away. It's, and I'm like, I kept two ball pythons in my life and it was in the 90s. And I paid way too much for wild caught animals. That's the only ball pythons I've ever owned. Okay. <laughs> they were really cool back then. <laughs> okay. But Anybody else <laughs> yeah. who gets into them now, it's still, I, I'd hate to say it, but it's not too late. People can still make money. People can still hit those crazy combos and keep going. And it seems to be a pyramid scheme, but it, it just keeps going. It's not ending. <laughs> yeah. There's so, some successful wow. pyramid yeah. schemes out there. Yeah, I was going to say, man. Yeah. I, I mean, I, and you know, you can, you can do, you can do the morph thing and, and you can, I just, you know, if 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 that's going to be your business and that's going to be your primary source of income, you need to be um, you need to be either producing in mass and advertising and marketing right, or you need to be uh, at the top of the of of the pyramid scheme, um, making new animals that are you know going to be bought by second, third, fourth, fifth tier breeders to to keep the thing going. So it depends on where you fall in the pyramid. But I mean, I still, I, I think still you're kind of changing it a little bit there because there's, you know, there's a lot of middle ground because I, no, I don't I know, agree. I agree. you know, if you I pick agree. a, if you pick a really good looking morph, even if it's fifty bucks, people are going to want to buy it because it's good looking, you know. So you, you can still, sure. still make a make it as a as a middle guy. But I guess my question is, well, and this is kind of purely academic and, and it doesn't matter. But if there were no morphs, would you see you know, nobody was keeping ball pythons for the most part before there were the morphs, and then that's kind of brought everybody in because it adds an extra layer of excitement. I mean, you don't you never know what's going to crawl out of the egg. You know, it could be some crazy and looking so thing. and and. And, and the whole idea of making combinations means, oh, I have to be a breeder. I have to produce these things and I make these combinations and, oh, this is cool. And so you're making little little breeders that uh, all eventually have their own rack systems and they're making their combos. And, you know, you can see very quickly how mathematically it turns into, oh, shit, we have too many ball pythons. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop why, some of the bigger breeders from going. Well, I'll, I'll and, take and, those rack systems off your hands, and I'll sure, you know, I'll, sure, sure, I'll sure. buy your and, wholesale animals, and and no and, problem. And, and, and you yeah. know, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Sutherlands have done really did really well with ball pythons, and mm -hmm. they, you know, they they're and and there's plenty of people who've done really well, but not everybody's the Sutherlands. Not everybody advertises. Not everybody markets like you. You know, not everybody does it professionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if everybody's goal is to be a breeder and to you know make the combos and those kinds of things, then it, it starts to get into that like you know kind of not potentially not. Uh, you good know what? Place. I, I see myself as like a small time breeder. I've been doing it for a long time, but yeah. I just breed. I breed a couple of clutches every year. And yet somehow I can move my animals. And did I adapt? Yeah. At first I used to have one clutch and I had a hard time selling one clutch. Now I just slowly find contacts and then I wholesale. And now I'm at the point where mm -hmm. Canada, anyway, I don't know if you guys knew, but I'm from Canada, but Canada sucks for selling carpets. Carpets aren't popular here. There's like three or four mm -hmm. people in all of Canada that breed them like regularly. And that's about it. If you want anything, we got to get them somewhere else. But uh, what do I do now? Now I'm considering the Asian market. The Asian market is crazy. Like it's, it's insane. They pay tons and tons of money. And I know many people from the States. I know one or two people from Canada that ship everything. They simply, they take everything one price and it's gone. Now, is that wrong? 
maybe ethically wholesaling, we could debate whether wholesaling, actually, actually I think you guys already did, whether wholesaling is right or not, but it's a way to move animals. And you, yeah, sure. Anyway, anyway, going back to that, like I'm, I'm doing it. I'm just a little tiny guy, small time breeder. This is not my job. I don't do this. I, I mainly, why do I breed snakes? I breed snakes to hit on the cool things that I want to line breed what I want and mm -hmm. to be able to sell an entire clutch just to buy, you know, two rough scale pythons or to be able to buy a black headed python that's two, three K here that I can't afford. But this way I can do it and I can use my snake money to buy more snake money. Yeah. So one could argue breeding snakes sure, gives yeah. you money to buy better snakes. <laughs> and, and, and I, I completely agree with that. I, th I think my issue is that when you end up with, you know, fifty or a hundred pairs of snakes, and you're you're breeding all of those snakes for what? To get you more snakes? Like when is it? You know, when does it? Like if 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 it always has to go to the, you know, to because breeding everything is better. When is breeding everything not better? Is it infinite breeding everything is better all the time, always? Or do you hit a point where you're like, this is not better. Not better for me, not better for the animals, not better for Canada, maybe better for the Asian market. We're not sure. <laughs> and, and, and I feel like the other part of it is too, like, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with wholesaling. And I think wholesaling has a, has a purpose. It serves a function. It's a good thing. But, but what it does is it, is it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it doles out the signal in what, in, in what the market can really handle. Because once it leaves you, you don't have to sell it. You don't have to deal with it. You don't know what happens to it. Does it does it perish? Does it sit in a, a reptile shop? Does it sit in a warehouse? You, you, we don't we don't really have a, a good you know it, it, when you wholesale you don't have a good pulse on that right? But, but when it sits in your collection and you're trying to sell it and you're competing with other people and maybe you're you know you being from Canada and only having you know uh, three other breeders to compete with might and and not having a lot of carpet sales there could be a tough a tough gig i get that part of it but but you don't necessarily get to feel like how hard now if you were producing 200 snakes a year and you always sold those snakes no problem you know you had your website you sold them boom you would you you would be you'd be like yep no problem i'm doing this i'm selling them no problem but if you had to sit on those animals and sit on those animals would you still feel like producing them every single year makes sense if you're not selling those animals without wholesale so my rule of thumb is I think, sorry go ahead just oh i i was just gonna say i think you know you, uh, Dominic kind of addressed that is is you can find other markets to kind of take that uh, you know well, but but yeah you're right it, it, there may be a finite point to that but yeah um, you know finding those those other uh, routes or, or mechanisms that that allows you to work with what you want to work with rather than just what's popular you know and I, I think it's kind of a boring world if everybody just works with what's most popular you know i, I like and, being and, able to yeah and i under and i understand we live in a global you know we live in a global sure. economy but you know shipping you know shipping over shipping overseas is not easier any anymore you know it tends to be a little bit harder so maybe it's not for everybody and 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 really you know that might be easier uh, in Canada. I don't know. What's, that, uh, what's yeah, the, I, I don't. How, yeah. How's the process that's, there in Canada? It's horrible. Is, not, is it horrible. pretty? A pain. In I, the I've, I've oh, never yeah. done it. I'm, yeah, I'm actually <laughs> looking into doing it, and yeah. I, all I know is that getting any appendix to animals from the states mm -hmm. is horrible. Uh, it takes forever, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. trying to ship and. But what about exporting from so? Like from Canada it, to to the Asian. It's market. been about three months of researching, and same, I'm. Same. I think I might have mm -hmm. it down. I think <laughs> we'll see. Okay. It's uh, yeah. it's it's definitely yeah. a tricky one. <laughs> so here's another argument that I'll I'll throw your way. Okay. So in nature, mm. um, you take wolves, you take their prey, you take anything like that. What happens? There's a lot of prey. There's a lot of breeding. There's a lot of offspring. It keeps going. What happens if you have too many offsprings? Eventually, they eat all the prey, and then eventually. There's no more prey. So what happens to all the predators? They slowly die off and then it keeps balancing itself, right? So nature will balance itself out always naturally from prey to predator. 
Now, if you look at the market or if you look at breeding animals in captivity, it's kind of the same thing. If we breed too much and there's too many animals, what will happen? It's going to saturate the market or people are going to be stuck with them. It's going to kind of prevent people from breeding because if there's no more room for them to go anywhere, there's no more room. They're going to have to slow down, not because they want to, because they can't really go anywhere. And then what's going to happen? It's always going to keep balancing itself to a certain degree. So is there a line? Of course there is. But I think... You don't need to stop yourself. Like I can tell you, if I still had my 100 babies from this year, next year, where would I put all yearlings next year? I don't. I, I might have enough space for 100 babies, but I don't have 100 space for 100 yearlings. And I can tell you that would slow me down. Would it prevent me from continuously breeding? To a certain degree, yes, but not because I don't want to. I don't know if I'm... See, but I kind of feel like it... Yeah, no, no, no. I got, yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying. I totally get what you're saying, and, and you know, I, I think I kind of feel like as somebody who who went from the breed as much as I can um, to um, now that I've bred years and I have refined some of my stuff. Now I'm selecting my projects, and I'm being more, you know, now that I have a line that has a name, uh, and I and I have this going and that going. I have some very specific pathways and directions that I go. And so maybe I don't try to breed everything, but I try to breed selectively down certain pathways. And I think that's that's kind of a natural trajectory. Whereas, you know, if you were to just start breeding everything so you can produce as much as you can. And yeah, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying as far as um, there, there being checks and balances in nature uh, for predator predation. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it, you know, in, in captive markets and in human controlled markets, we can, we can harness almost an unlimited amount of resource uh, to kind of artificially push that way further than would be a natural homeostatic balance in nature. So w we have the capacity and we've done it with our populations. You see why we hunt deer and do things like that because we've whacked out those, those, those homeostatic balances and now, and now the snapback uh, is it, it's out of balance and it's no good. So I guess what I'm saying is that potentially that overproduction, you know, yes, it'll have a rebound effect. Absolutely. And, and you're right. There's a cost that, that comes with that. But I think that's where I bring in the efficacy of it because on, on that rebound, there's probably suffering. And is that suffering necessary? And is that suffering, you know, part of uh, the, 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 the ethical way we should think about how we, how we, and I, it's so hard not to agree with you because you know how many retired breeders or animals <laughs> I don't breed anymore because I went a certain way, you know, yeah. like I, I bred yeah. the Jag. I have a pure coastal exantic Jag. I bred him one year, got the exantics out of him that don't have Jag and I'm never breeding Jag again. So I get it, and I'm, yeah. I can't. Yeah. I got to argue against you, right? So I, <laughs> I don't really have a choice on this one. Sure, sure, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we, do. we we don't always get to argue the side we like, but we got to argue the side we get. <laughs> so that was a bit yeah. tough, but so how do I argue that? I mean, one could say, so in that situation, why don't I just breed the jag? Why don't I just breed more? Because you know what, people love them. They're gorgeous. They're a lighter color. They're less patterned. They do. They they might be weird little freaks, but people love them. So if I can make money, if I can reproduce them, why not? Is it ethical? Then you can go into derpy herbs. But ethically, is it wrong to produce more pure jags? Why wouldn't I be able to do it? I retired him, but why 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 don't I do that? Yeah, I mean, derpy herbs. I don't know. You know, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, you know, I, look. I, I think. I think. I, I think the the circumstance and the application matters. Uh, the the specific example matters. And and in some cases, yeah, go for it. In some cases, mm, it's a bad example, and and you gotta you gotta kind of. But but how do you regulate that? When is when you know? There's so there's so much into it. Uh, that that um, you know, 
hey man, less people are into Jags than they used to be. They were all the rave mm-hmm. back in the day, and now it, not even the Podfather will touch them. So it's like, you know, what what you <laughs> He's know, got one, at I what think. point, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but never to be bred again, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, it, it, it's kind of. You know, and, and and look, I'm not here telling anybody never to breed their stuff. If you want to breed it, breed it. But there, the, there's there's the other side of things to think about. And 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 look, there's look. I'm just going to be honest. There's people here who do not give a shit about the animals, and all they care about is the money. And if that's what they're there for, they're going to do that anyway. And there's no stopping them from that. And and you know, it doesn't even mean that somebody who does care about the animals and doesn't care about the money can't make a mistake, overproduce, and have an animal suffer from it. It's just sometimes that happens. Like it, it's both ways. You know what I mean? And I guess all I'm saying is that that. It, it's super complex. It's super, you know, kumbaya fight club right now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. Um, but, but at the same time, I, I just feel like there is, there's so many um, potential pitfalls. And, and where we are in um, legislative laws and how we're viewed by the, pu- the public at large, you know, I feel like we have to be cognizant of, of how we produce especially if it's an excess. Hey, but isn't it better, like one of the probably prime argument I should have used from now is, isn't it better to produce captive bread than to steal from the wild? The more I produce, the less will be stolen, right? So maybe not with yeah, Australian herb, but you could take, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know what you guys have there. Ball pythons. Well, ball pythons, yeah. sure, they're still imported, right? So the more you breed in captivity, the more that is produced and the more that is freely handed out in the market, well, eventually people will stop taking them from the wild. If you produce more in captivity and breed everything that has a Cleoka, you're going to stop stealing from the wild. So technically, indirectly helping. And who cares what they produce? It doesn't even matter because it's not from the wild. God, this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but but I think that there's that there's money to be made and that there's countries that will write exportation permits um, be- because of that. And so there's plenty of – there's no shortage of green tree pythons. We don't need to be importing green tree pythons anymore, but we do because well, they're writing those uh, exportation I, permits. I think there's a, there's a kind of a mixed bag there because you do have you know countries that if they're not – exporting for the pet trade and they're not making that money exporting the pet trade then they're going to look at them for skins or food or you know things like that so you know if you stop all of a sudden and say okay no more imports uh go ahead and do what you will with them you know then all of a sudden their habitat goes away and they get you know used as skins or or food then all of a sudden you you know you have an endangered species in in those countries you know right i I mean obviously that's a that's an extreme i I get i I get yeah. that, but and and I think importation has its place in keeping genetic diversity. I mean, you can look at the issue that we have with carpets and our genetic diversity. I mean, mm-hmm. everyone thinks that a jungle carpet looks just like a U.S. jungle carpet, and they won't see it <laughs> any other way, right? Yeah. Because all they've seen is what U.S. jungle carpets look like, which have been line bred to all look the same. So, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that, that that's so importation has its place. Um, but, but I also think, you know, captive breeding has its place. And so you're never going to shut down both, but at the same time, is that a justification to, is, is, is having very, very robust captive markets, a, 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 a true justification for potential overproduction? I think that's the question. <sighs> <laughs> Have we have we reached our uh, saturation no, here? We've we've uh, brought. A, you have any other topics well, it, you you want to bring? Not up quite or? sure. It's, it's so hard to debate the side that I just want to make it clear that I'm completely yeah completely oh, yeah. for yeah. like yeah. I collectively <laughs> listen, read everything. Listen. But <laughs> you, if you win yeah. the coin toss, <laughs> you make a good decision. So, says the double winner. Your life is yeah. yeah is, your life is not bad. But listen, there was a whole year. <laughs> where I lost every single coin toss to Sweet Lady DDP over here, and it was horrible. But we sold you on. Right. 
Yeah, but I, no, I think I think you guys have both brought up really good, you know, topics and 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 really good uh, conversation starters. And you know, obviously, all, any issue we discuss on here is not one sided, is not simple, is not going to be yeah. so, solved by you know I- anything. We're just kind of making people aware of both sides. And and obviously, you know, you want to think about what you're doing if you're breeding animals you don't want to just do it indiscriminately and you you want to have a plan for what you're going to do and i think a lot of people you know start out maybe a little too quickly and they they buy up all the animals and then they start breeding them and then they're like oh wait i nobody wants to buy them for me cuz nobody knows who i am you know yeah. if you start out slow you you get a good reputation you can kind of build and then you like chuck said you kind of find that balance of what what can I move? What can I sell? You know, am I breeding too much? And maybe I'll cut back a little bit the next year. Or or may, nobody wanted to buy these, so I'm not going to breed them this next year because I still have babies and I don't have room for yearlings, like Dominic said. You know, so there's there's all sorts of things to consider if you're going to breed. Um, and, and you know, it's not one or the other. There's there's yeah. obviously a and mixture. I, th- of I think if you right? have if you have a set of carpets that. Every year you produce them, you sell them off, and you keep yeah. keep, keep keep going, man. But mm-hmm. maybe you don't do that with everything. Maybe yeah. maybe your you know maybe your prothensis you don't do that because for whatever maybe they don't maybe they're not well known or well, you know whatever. However, or you need that to make more out. of them because yeah. so few survive. You know you got so, yeah. <laughs> and you love headaches. You know you love and you love headaches. <laughs> yeah. So so how about the other side of the argument? Pull it, pull it. Sorry. I missed that. Um, so oh, how often yeah. do you go on, on Facebook and you look at the post and people are like, hey, so I just got myself a Brettles Python and uh, I'm going to put it in with my uh, Darwin because that's my only two snakes. OK, mm-hmm. so I, I already know <laughs> you guys probably see that and it's like, Ugh. well, anyway, it, it does that to me. And like, <laughs> I can't believe people yeah. do that, but people do. <laughs> And then I look back at where I started. When I first got my first snake, I remember it was sold to me as a coastal, but it had red all over the side as an adult. And it was obviously a cross between either a Darwin or an IJ or West Papuan, whatever, uh, mixed to a coastal and all that. And if it wasn't for that snake that I bred for the first time to, I don't even know what the mother was. And there was no described lineage. It was bought in a pet store and all that. But everybody starts somewhere. Everybody breeds whatever it is they breed at the start. Yeah. And then yeah. from there you start and that's what gets you going. Like if it wasn't for my weird cross hybrid animals, the first carpets that I ever bred in the nineties. And for all you know, those animals probably propagated to yeah. tons of other people and have destroyed <laughs> the lineage, but that's, that doesn't help my side. <laughs> but if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I am now breeding <laughs> what I want are maybe specific. So yeah. is it wrong? Usually we all start somewhere. We all have to do it. And when you start, you might not have the money to buy the $700 German line jungle bread for high yellow, blah, blah, blah. And from him and the other one, and maybe people are looking at that $700 jungle. Like I'd rather buy the $150 jungle that's written on the wholesaler table at the show. I don't know. Just mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, sure. And I and I, I bet you look back at that animal like with fondness, and you're not thinking, how, you know, why did I ever buy that dirty blankety blank, you know, cross or whatever. you know, you you probably liked that carpet. And I, I did. It, I know, kept and, it for and, and a really for long time. That good stuff, just as well as you do. But I would never yeah. do that again. Now I I, yeah. I like I look at that and I wouldn't even touch it with a ten sure, foot pole. Sure, sure. You wouldn't but buy another one. <laughs> we we all move for them, uh-huh. and if it wasn't yeah. for breeding whatever had a Cleoka back then, it wouldn't have brought me to where I am. And I think a lot of people are like that. We all start breeding whatever it is we have. So why did people breed a green tree to a carpet? I'm assuming they just, that's the only two animals they had at one point, and that's how it started. And look at that. As much as I hate those carpondros, they're gorgeous. Gorgeous. It's a beautiful hybrid. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't say it's not nice. So is it yeah. wrong ethically? I yeah, they are I mean, it's completely animals. wrong, but it's, 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 you, <laughs> you, you can't deny their beauty. There's a reason people do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sure, sure. I mean, I 
you know, and 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 I don't necessarily think that all all, all crosses or hybrids end up in in you know bad relationships with owners. Uh, you know, I, I think you know a lot of cool snakes come out of stuff, and a, a lot of people get hooked on it. I I think it's 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 more to me it's more the idea of what 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 we push. And, and and I guess it, it's like this: Does everybody have to become a breeder? Does everybody have to breed snakes? Does everybody have to get into it to be a breeder? Because I feel like the way we talk about it and the way we romanticize it makes everyone want to be that way. And and when it is that way, then then all of those pitfalls, which I talked on, you know, kind of come into play at scale, right? And so. Yes, you know, we look at it that way, but should we talk about it like everyone should look at it so, that way? And, 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 and what is, you know, it, but who are, we, you know, and, and at the same time, who am I to say that anyone shouldn't want to breed their snakes together or, or whatever, you know what I mean? But, yeah. you know, it, it, it's definitely in, in carpet pythons, uh, people who breed their you know, Darwin to a, a a Brettles are mucking up the lines, plain and simple, plain and simple. But you know, are there people out there who are working to keep that separate? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you know, as stories changes, as time goes on, as people's mu- you know memories get fuzzy, you know, stuff gets crossed and things happen, and you know, it, it, it so. You know, I don't know. I don't. There's no right answer, and I'm talking in circles now. But, but, you know, there. To me, it's it's kind of like the greater message of of what what as reptile breeders and reptile keepers we're going to put out there. And is it is it is it that there's no problem producing as much as you want and do it, have fun with it, go wild, get crazy. Um, cause it's all, you know, it's a buffet and everybody's eaten. Um, or is it, Hey, listen, Americans are fat. Watch your portion size, eat healthy, be careful. Right. I that feel like I maybe, debate. you know, yeah, the, 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 the country buffet <laughs> argument. Yeah, I know. Right. You know, you put it, you put it like that in, in, in simple cracker barrel terms, so- you know. But yeah, but so. the the whole reptile industry has changed. If you look at over twenty years ago when you guys had animals, mm-hmm. like I never even thought of breeding. I knew nobody that bred, and I was on the forums. I was on the the old uh, I don't even know what it is where you would write and you'd wait a day. Jeez, I'm I'm dating myself. But <laughs> yeah. back then, like I kept for <laughs> over ten years, and I had one blood python, I had one scrub, I had one African rock, I had mm-hmm. one bull snake, I had one of this, I had. I never even considered mm-hmm. pairing them up, but back then that was the mentality. You kept what you loved and you experienced and you did it, right? So we did that. I find it went all the way to everybody mm-hmm. needs to be a breeder. And for the past like 10, 15 years, it's been everybody mm-hmm. needs to be a breeder and breed everything. And I almost feel like there's almost a shift going on again, where now it's nobody should keep an Iraq. Everybody should yeah. keep bioactive and these gigantic setup with only a few animals and blah, blah, blah. Okay, I can't shift back to there. I like, I don't know, I like my front-facing cages to look at my animals. I'm never going to go bioactive, but that's my personal choice. But I feel like people are moving away from the breeder again and moving towards, again, the keeping. Not that, it, it, I don't know, maybe that's just my observation. But Yeah, no, I, I think great. you're I mean, right. That, yeah. You know, I, yeah. you know I, 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 there's a place for that. You know, I, I think... Yeah. Um, all, all things in all places, um, you know, I, I, and look, listen, you know, I, I love my wife, but she is an idealist and she's an amazing idealist. And she, you know, she, she truly goes hard for the right things in society. Me, I'm a, I, I'm a realist with, with, with the hopes of an idealist, right? I recognize that things are going to be the way they're going to be. And that's how the reptile industry is. It's going to be the way it's going to be, but the idealist in all of us should still be present and talking, right? Because it's going to be the way it's going to be. But 
it, it, it's what we put forward in, in, in discussions like this, where we talk about it, we bring up the, 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 the idea, and somebody thinks, you know what? That I, Okay, I heard that. I get that. I understand yeah. that. And when they go to do that, maybe they think about that. Or maybe they don't. And then they learn the lesson of the realist, yeah. right? Yeah, we never declare a winner on here. We just, you know, bring up as many points for for either side that we can and yep. and and the listener makes their decision of what, you know, what they're going to do with their uh animals and with, you know, those kind of things. So, hopefully uh all you listening have have gotten something out of this and uh, you know, it was a really good discussion. I appreciate, you know, your the points that you brought up and uh yeah, great stuff. So, thanks again for coming on, Dominic and um, I, I don't know. I kind of like I like to after after the debate. I like to kind of get back on the same page and you know see if if there's anything cool you've heard out in the hobby, like any any good content you've listened to or any cool things you've seen lately uh, in the reptile industry. Just to kind of you know kumbaya. For kumbaya. A bit. <laughs> I, I just listened to yeah I just listened to uh, Venom Exchange Radio uh, Phil and Nipper they had a great uh, show just recently kind of talking about the trip that we all went on down in Southern Arizona so that was fun nice. to hear yeah I, they, those guys they did are great. the trip yeah. recap yeah yeah so uh, you know kind of from the venomous perspective but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. keep venomous but I really enjoy listening to that show Mate. best best Mate. voices. Best podcast I was voices. Say, in the, just listen to in, it know, for his accent, space, right? At least for the reptiles. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And F- yeah. and Phil's deep, you know, baritone voice. Oh, his, yeah. Yes, his, he, he's great. I, I think yeah. I listened to maybe one or two episodes of The Venomous, but the problem is, like, there's so many Latin names that people keep putting out. And if you don't keep yeah. Venomous Snakes, yeah. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, yeah. You keep, yeah. I have to it's, I have yeah. to pause and look it up, you know, and yeah. sometimes but I it's, spell it's it wrong. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Like I try to listen to other things, like the Boa 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 podcast. Like I'm going to listen to it. I don't keep boas, but I want to uh-huh. listen to it. And then it's like they're going to say these yeah. continuous names of other things, and I'm like, I don't know. I I know what Imperator is now, or I know what Corallus is. I know a couple of them, but I don't know the rest. I know like I know yeah. my little like little niche or. Uh, am I allowed to say that? Nipper? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yep. Nipper. So, but I, I wish nipper. that some yeah. people would every now and then, like whenever you say Tracy, you should use the common name once or twice in the whole podcast so people can follow you. Because mm-hmm. sure. I'll be honest, I, 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 I still That's don't remember point. what a Tracy is. I'm... I'm mm-hmm. So yeah. that's the that's the Hama Harris scrub. So python. why don't you just say a scrub? So that's or a Somalia. Tracy. I know yeah. what Somalia is. I don't keep <laughs> Somalia. They're they're not legal here. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. A, I mean, that's a great I, suggestion. I think you know. I I think we all kind of fall into that sometimes or in another. But it is good to remember that not everybody listening. And I I don't know. I listen to. Um, the Smartless podcast, and and uh, one of the hosts has a sister, and they always use her name Tracy to say, "Oh, for Tracy, this is what we're talking about," you know, like because they'll use lingo from acting yeah. or whatever. So it's kind of so, yeah, so this like one's for layman's, Tracy, yeah. layman's terms for Tracy, <laughs> exactly. So we, gotcha. we need to have our uh, Tracy moments and say, you know, that, for, that's a good idea. That's, that's I, this. That's piece. actually right. a. That's I'm a, just that's putting an it out there. Outstanding suggestion and a, and a like very a lot of people fair know point. their domain. No, but I, I like it. Man, the I mean, podcast where Joe Phelan yeah. used to do it with his with Melissa for a while, but when he yeah. did it with her, he used somebody who knew a uh-huh. lot with somebody who was not even keeping herbs or anything like that. Dude, but by dude, doing yeah. that, it made yeah. it that if they were talking yeah. about geckos, let's say I know nothing about geckos, I don't know anything that has legs, I don't keep them. Mm-hmm. But if they started talking about their geckos or their mm-hmm. their things <laughs> like that, at least I could follow. I find it so hard. So listening to the the Venom podcast, it's yeah. a great podcast. I think it's super interesting, but I'm missing half the information because they're talking about this and this and this, and it's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you listen to, I mean, meeting Nipper and, and hearing him talk. Yeah, I yeah. had to ask a lot. Like, what are you talking about? And and like, we we did have this discussion with uh, Justin um, from you know from the uh, Herp Network, uh, yeah. Justin Smith, and and talking about Schmitty! using 
yeah, using common names versus um, uh, scientific names. And there, for some animals, there, that's all there's yeah. known is the yeah. scientific name. Good, so, you know, it makes good it luck to get it into in yeah. vertebrates and using common exactly. names. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tarantulas and things like that. Yeah. That's like the common name is the scientific name. But, yeah. you know, you're right for, for the. For the niche, the nippers that we we get into, you know, sometimes you. we we forget that uh, there's a lot of people that don't know what you're talking about, and you're going to lose an audience. You know, sometimes people will just be like, okay, too many, too many Latin names, I'm out of here. You know, so that's well, a that's I a mean, very I, good I think, suggestion. I, I definitely yeah. think one of the goals here is to bridge gaps and to get people thinking, and yeah. and so if 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 using you know the the common name uh, helps do that, then that's you know absolutely. I'm just saying, what like we do once that. in the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I got you. Um, exactly. I got you. Well, and and you. also, uh, you know, the uh, Nipper's dog out in the background, like, you know, panting and whining every once in a while. That was kind of funny. I wasn't sure if it was Nipper or the dog, but it was funny to listen uh, to. The, uh, yeah. Everybody pants. Those. I was to think of which one that I listened to. I actually really found interesting. Uh, let me just pull it up. Uh, Collybred Radio. Uh, mm-hmm. Every now and then they do the shows that are specific to specific mm-hmm. things. The last one they did, I'm just looking it up right now, was on specific. I think, I think it was just baby keeping. Is that possible? Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, raising yeah, and uh, I, neonates. Yeah, I think that was their last. Yeah, they episode, did a couple. So. Is that baby, baby time? Yeah. And I, I found that super interesting. I don't keep color grids, but so many things applied, and I love. They've done a couple of shows that are very specific to like the breeding or the feeding or things like that, but they really go really well into detail. And I personally, I love those shows. Like it's, it's really interesting because you get to, you get to really learn yeah, a lot on yeah. it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's another one I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. I, I always, I always have to catch myself thinking, Oh, maybe I should get some clue. No, 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 <laughs> no colubrids. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't want to turn into one here. I, the I, I, ha- <laughs> I, dude, I haven't even ventured <laughs> down the path because I, dude, there's yeah. no way I could. I mean, do there's it. like, so, it's yeah, hard it's because there's much. so it's many cool much. reptiles yeah. out there, but yeah, you, you almost have to specialize to some extent. Although I don't mm-hmm. know my, my buddy, uh, Brody, he, we've end the shows together and I mean, he'll come back to the table with just this assortment of stuff. And I'm like, does that fit in? You know, and a lot of times, you know, he'll sell some of the projects that don't work out at the shows and things. So you're like, Oh, you know, what happened with this one or what, you know, that kind of thing. But it's, it's he's, kind of fun making, cause you get he's to make an get, omelet. Yeah. You get to experience a lot of different cool species. And I mean, a lot of mm-hmm. the stuff that he keeps, I'm like, Oh, I'm kind of glad he's buying that because I want to, you know, see that more often. And if he's successful with it, then I'll see little baby. I mean, I, and I don't it's think kinda there's, cool. a, I don't think there's an issue with dipping your toe in in a lot yeah. of places. It yeah. makes you more well-rounded. It, uh-huh. You know, it's just, you know. When you do it that way, it, you got to go wide, but you can't go deep. Yeah, if you don't yeah. go, it, you know, if you don't go wide, you can go deep. Yeah. But it's very, very, very difficult to go wide and deep at the same yeah. time. Don't you find That's that every you time know? you try yeah. that though, like you go because I don't know your friend is passionate about Brazilian rainbow boas. I got a pair of Brazilian yeah. rainbow boas two mm-hmm. years ago. They're still in my collection, <laughs> and I, I, I don't really care about them. I don't really look at them. I take care of them, but I can tell you they're going to be moved. I've done that yeah. with two other pairs of boas. I've done that with other there. And I find like I get this passion yeah. from someone else. So I try it and then I'm like, but these aren't for me. Or these aren't, these don't fall into my little yeah. bubble yep. of things that I really like. You know, I can never have too many Morelias, yeah. but yeah. I can have two boas and it's too, <laughs> ma- too, too many. Yeah. It's just, it's just not me. But, and, yeah, and why yeah, do you get them? Yeah. Because you, your friend is so passionate. Your buddy talks about it because you hear a show about it yeah. and you try and you're like, I don't even know why I tried it. Yeah. I already knew it wasn't for me. Yeah. yeah. It is hard when somebody's really excited about something and it's funny to listen to, you know, like, oh, and say, quit talking yeah. about these, you know, every time I bring up a species I love, all of a sudden everybody buys them out and then you can't find them anymore, you know, stop buying them. They're yeah, terrible. They've got everything. But, you know, it is, it is hard not to get excited yeah, about stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Uh, let, let people know how they can, you know, find you or see your um, stuff, what you're working on. My with. Um, name is under, uh, domsreptiles.com. I've got a small little website that I kind of keep okay. updated. Uh, I probably have 60 animals to put up for sale, but there's only three, but there's more. Uh, Instagram, Dom's Reptiles, and Facebook is my name, Dominic Capano. 
our Dominic Carboneau. I don't know how to say it in English. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, say that in again. French. The right Dominic way? Dominic <laughs> Carboneau. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's good to hear uh, the right way. Yeah. <laughs> I, Justin's I could probably not try to pronounce it like that. Yeah. yeah. I'd probably butcher yeah. it. So, yeah. I'll, I'll let you say it and <laughs> everything yeah. you have. But, yeah. Oh, you I make it sound it, good, though. You make yeah, it sound good. I want to bring yeah, up it's... one last thing. So, you posted up your poster with all your different localities. Sure. Okay. Pockets, right? Love it. Uh huh. But this leads yeah, me yeah, to the yeah. next yeah. question. No, oh, great thanks, job. Like, thanks. I want one. But I want to know. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm looking at <laughs> yeah. them, and I was looking at the top right corner, you're putting West Papuans, you're putting Darwins, uh-huh. and you're putting another species or another locality of pythons all under, yeah, Cape all York, under Cape one okay. Latin yeah, name. Yep. Right? <laughs> is it fair yeah. to assume, yeah. so, is it fair yeah, to assume the... <laughs> that this is the new taxonomy that's coming? No, 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 no. We're we're not tax- taxonomists. So basically, you're, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion a book, about that. A lot of people that. have kind of picked and said, "Hey, wait, what about this? What about this?" Yeah, exactly. And I I think that's that's raised a lot of uh, questions. But I mean, obviously, I think- the book's going <laughs> to describe it in, in in much more detail than I can. But basically, the overall you know take home message is that we looked at the available data. And that's the best thing that Nick and I could agree on, first off, and come up with as far as the, the, <laughs> the, the, the data, like right? A, so that, that's, that's kind of, I mean, the, the yeah, yeah. And, and some and others, it's splitting, too, because we've got mm-hmm. the, you know, the gammons, gammon ranges uh, carpets that we've kind of split away from inlands. And yeah, I mean, it's, it is, uh, <laughs> It's it's maybe gonna get us in trouble, and there might be some readers of the book, or they're like, "These guys are nuts," and and that's fine. I mean, that's science. You know, you you try to fit the data, you try to make the best uh, guess at what's going on, and we'll leave it to other people to to do the actual taxonomic work. And unfortunately, I I heard that the the group that did the the Antaresia uh, paper is also the working on job. carpet. So we're, we're going to, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. But as far as we can, you know, the, as far as we can glean the, the best genetic work that's been done kind of lines up with what does we're, it line up with that poster? as far as that goes. Yeah. Okay. Cause to some extent, I was a yeah, bit surprised. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely yeah. hard to draw a line and say this is where this ends and this is where this begins. But I mean, there's some like a lot of things come into play. You know, biogeographic barriers and and uh, one of the one of my favorite kind of um, epiphanies doing the book was um, lining up the genetic uh, work that's been done with uh, drainage basins in Australia. And so the drainage basins actually line up really well with the different putative, you know, genetic uh, separations. So, you know, that's kind of what we're going off. And there's, there, I mean, the evolutionary history chapter is greatly expanded in this version, second version. So yeah. there's a lot of discussion on that. And, you know, anybody can take it or leave it, you know, if it's, and, and I imagine that people will keep the same common names, you know, like you're not going to necessarily call your Northern uh, coastal carpet, a, a jungle carpet, just because they're now lumped in with Cheney eye. But, uh, there is a big difference between the Southern coastals around Brisbane and those that are further North and the, the coastals, you know, up further North, the, the Northern coastals, there's no real genetic difference with jungles that are, you know, in the same region that they are. So jungle is just a, you know, kind of a, a, a morph, if you will, of, of a rainforest regional, carpets, a regional, yeah, a regional variant. variant. Yeah. That are, that, that blend in better in the forest, you know, so. I imagine if you took jungles out of the forest and bred them in a savanna or something over successive generations, you'd probably see none that look like a, a what you'd consider a jungle. So, I don't know. That's kind of what we're, what what prompted that. And and I thought the the poster is kind uh, of a primer for the book, but I will. I it was meant to be kind of a companion to the book. Almost so, add it you know, in the book. But I but I got impatient. <laughs> yeah, I I uh, got impatient, and 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 there are some figures that are kind of similar to that where we have all the different pictures of the carpets and you know the, the but not hand drawn by the doctor not hand drawn yeah 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, but yeah, I'm, 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 I, I forgot to mention the poster, but yeah, I've got a bunch printed out and I'm ready to start shipping. I think I sent one to the pod, a couple to the pod father and I, I, I offered to it to mine. Chuck, but no, you, I, I, you didn't, I, you didn't listen, give me your address. Listen, I was but. in the middle of the shit storm. Calm <laughs> yeah. down. I want them. I want them, man. It's too late, Damn. man. Too late. You wow. offer your sitting Offers all off day. the table. <laughs> no, Snooze, no. you lose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> seriously. What the heck? So I, I, I've, I'm trying to get the pricing down, you know, to figure out. So the the guy at the post office told me a price, and then I actually shipped one to Eric, and and he charged a different price. So I'm like, how is this working here? But anyway, <laughs> so, you know, I guess it's fine. But I, I just don't want to go out there and lose money. I, I learned the hard way because uh, with the first edition of the carpet book, I, I, uh, it cost like. I think thirteen, seventeen dollars to send a book to Australia. So I set up everything on the website when the Antaresia book came out to ship books for seventeen dollars, and so people prepaid for books, and then all of a sudden the shipping was thirty-five dollars. They doubled the price overnight without really, you know, any fanfare. So I go to ship the books, and they're like, "Yeah, that's thirty-five dollars." I'm like. Wait, what? It's, it was 17 a couple weeks ago. You know, what are you doing to me? And so I, I basically like broke even. I'm giving away free books, you know. I, I'm, I'm not, not making a dime on them, and, and I had to pay for them, you know. So it's like, oh, boy. So what do you do? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I've learned the hard way well, a couple times. But I should have a good idea of what these things cost. So I'm going to start yeah, sending be. some out to kind of no, figure it's that cool out that you're doing that. I, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing it just because I'm really curious. I, I thought Metcalfi would have become their own oh, species. Thanks. Yeah. And I was pretty sure Shenye and um, <laughs> Megdowley, so you would have lumped those two completely together. Um, I don't know why the Darwin and the IJ was a bit of mm-hmm. a surprise to me, but... <laughs> oh. Yeah, though I mean, just the genetic work that's been done show that show that at least the 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 New Guinea and the Cape York stuff is very closely related, and they're both fairly closely related to Darwin's. A little further afield from Darwin's, but since I don't know, we didn't <laughs> we weren't sure what to do with the naming, so it was easier just to call them all variegata and be done with it. But you know, again, this is just our best idea of what what how it could fit and how it could. So work. you think it's but, gonna, you know there's there's a lot of different ways. You, you think that's going to make that it out. a Darwin locality or a West Papuan locality? No, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, it, I, there's there's still localities, you know, but um, the I think the original was described up in in you know northern Australia, so. Um, you know, if anything, the the Cape York and the New Guinea stuff would be uh, uh, something different, maybe than the Darwin. But they they group together pretty closely. And the fact that you know rising seas and lowering seas kind of make that land bridge come back, and populations can intermix. So you know, what? How long does it take to speciate or to subspeciate or whatever? You know, it's hard to say. So that's a question. That that was one of the things you know that we kind of said, okay, we'll agree on this. But I I was thinking, you know, the New Guinea and the and the Cape Yorks were a little little uh, separate from the Darwins, a little further diverged over time, a little longer separated, kind of you know that idea. But uh, Nick wanted them to be very goddess, so I went, okay, I can live with that. <laughs> yeah, so. It's all it's all fun to fun to think about those things, but yeah, hopefully the book will, will give give you a lot better uh, insight into our thinking and, and rationale on what we did. But, I look forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, I appreciate the comments. All right, well, I guess that does it for another episode of Reptile Fight Club. Uh, join us again next week for some more fighty goodness. That's it? You're not going to give the podfather oh, his due? I, okay. Gosh dang it. I always forget. <laughs> Jeez, okay. man. Thanks to Morelia Python Radio Network for housing our podcast so graciously. And uh, check out all their stuff on the socials. <laughs> you know where to find them. You know what's going on. You know the deal. All right. Well, thanks for listening. You know what really grinds my cloaca? Wait, so-